Thank you uh, for coming to this session. Uh, the title for this session is An Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer Looks at Bitcoin's Technology and Online Gaming. Okay. Uh, basically, Bitcoins is a technology that the law hasn't really come to grasp with. Uh, I don't know, my primitive mind can't grasp all these Bitcoin concepts, but there are some things I do know. Bitcoins offers tremendous utility to gaming operators and to customers. Okay. The benefits are generally in the, what I would call the core payment processing attributes of speed, low cost, security and privacy, or anonymity. Now, all these characteristics hold appeal to customers, but in, in varying degrees. Okay. Speed of transactions, customers certainly like getting their deposits into action with minimum delay. And when they cash out, they like getting their funds back somewhat expeditiously and, and, and securely. How fast is a Bitcoin transaction for online gaming? Well, anecdotal evidence has been telling me that a U.S. consumer can walk into, you know, at currently thousands of retail locations and well-known well chains change their cash into online payment uh, service balances, and by, by the time they get home, be able to instantly transfer his Bitcoins online. Total time for cash out, total time from cash to the deposit to play runs under an hour. I want you to keep this chain of consumer and provider activity in mind, however, because we're going to get back to it when we start talking about legalities. For casual users, there's a certain appeal for the lower cost. If you're in the U.S., you are currently looking at costs which are now being passed on by the online gaming industry of anywhere for up to 10, 15 percent on cash outs or deposits. For consumers who are using bitcoins, their costs are going to be much lower to buy them. If they keep them in a wallet for later use or for investment, then the transaction costs you know, shrink as close to zero as you're likely to get. Gaming consumers in the U.S. do value privacy and security, but for the consumers, privacy pretty much means they want to keep away from nosy credit analysts when they're applying for a mortgage, from you know, spouses who may not otherwise know that they're uh, they're doing some gaming activities and happen to bank jointly. Or if you have a real anonymity you know, from, you know, from real uh, know your customer identification by the gaming company. Personally, I don't think this last attribute customers will really care about. The anonymity appeal exists, but it's been likely, at least going forward in the U.S., will have been waived in the initial uh, Bitcoin purchase. Because when you're converting local, local currencies into Bitcoins at this point, at least you know, what we're clearly seeing from the regulators now are that there will be some sort of uh, know your customer uh, regulations that are going, you know, going to be applicable. It's possible to go locally and buy Bitcoins from cash from people on the street. Um, <clears throat> whether those folks are going to have to uh, go out and become licensed is not the topic I'm addressing today. but. What I'll tell you is that the industry people that I've spoken to pretty much are unanimous in thinking that players don't really care if, they're, uh, if their operator knows who they are. You know, as a matter of fact, they probably trust them more than they trust their banks. And anonymity won't really stop people from using Bitcoins. I mean, the lack of, lack of anonymity won't stop them using the Bitcoins. <clears throat> okay, but is this legal? Uh, bluntly put, neither you know, what the consumer does with it, nor the operator caught in the denominating their gaming activities. Uh, I, by the way, I say gaming, excuse me, I'm from Nevada. To be gaming means gambling. I realize there's a much broader application, and I'll get into that later on. Whatever you do, the fact that you're using bitcoins doesn't change the legality or not. Uh, you know, earlier this year, I got into this area because I had some gambling companies who were interested in the area. Um, there was a, this breathless article that I think was in Business Week, you know, do Bitcoins make online gambling legal in the U.S. or anywhere else? The answer is no. It doesn't change the legality of what's being done. Basically, the gambling is still gambling. Social gambling is still just gaming. The measurement's going to be elements of consideration, chance or skill, 
uh, prizing, and in different combinations, that's going to determine whether the underlying activity is gambling and whether or not somebody offering those services is breaking the law. Um, there are obviously things like skill games, which, you know, can, which are allowed to charge fees, and I know there, there are poker sites out there that, that have monthly subscription fees, and people can come in and pretty much play tournaments. It's a, you know, the, well, it's a skill game and it's allowed. Uh, fantasy sports is, you know, is another form of, uh, in my mind, gambling out there, but uh, according to the federal government, at least in the 2006 act, not really gambling. I, you know, state laws, I think, are still up in the air. Okay. So leaving aside the legality of what the players are doing, what about the operators? Accepting bitcoins as deposits or maintaining reserves for cash outs presents specific risks, risks to the operators. Operators in most regulated jurisdictions are required to maintain valid know your customer information on their players. However, that's not a real barrier. Know your customer regulations are not new in the gaming and regulated gaming. And by themselves, in my view, would not preclude accepting bitcoins as deposits. FinCEN published regulations, which everybody here has heard about by now, about bitcoins. Well, there's also sets of regulations out on uh, what brick and mortar casinos have to do if somebody walks in with cash. Generally, in the gaming regulations that I have looked at for online gaming, so long as the operator, and I'm speaking generally by the way, this isn't legal advice, I haven't looked at every jurisdiction, and I'm not speaking about it specifically, but generally, as long as an operator who is required to have know your customer processes in place identifies the customer, that seems to be the, 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 major, you know, the, the, the major hurdle they have to get over. It's somewhat analogous to, you know, if, the, if, a, if a brick and mortar casino here if you walk into a brick and mortar casino with $300 in cash, or, or if you go and use the ATM machine on the floor, they're, no, you know, they're not required to know whether or not you had robbed the liquor store, gone to your bank, put the money into your, into, your, you know, into your debit card account, and then come in and use the debit card to get cash to gamble. Generally, my understanding of the know your customer requirements and the source of funds requirements for online gaming pretty much will parallel that, that if, if the transaction is coming from a reputable, you know, a reputable regulated entity, let's say like, you know, your bank and you're sending a, a, a card, you know, then there's no problem. I would be willing to argue in front of most regulators that if I know who you are, the fact that you're using a Bitcoin doesn't really, you know, change anything as far as me knowing, my, knowing the customer. I haven't seen specific regulations promulgated yet, and they might be out there, might be under process, that would prohibit an online gaming operator from accepting Bitcoins. I know, I know there's some gaming lawyers in the audience. If anybody wants to tell me I'm wrong, great, I'll learn something. To be, to be honest, I, start, I volunteered to do this panel so that I can learn from people who probably know more than I do in the area. Okay. The second utility for Bitcoins for operators is something that pretty much goes unnoticed but beyond, you know, as a payment method for underbank customers, there are important utilities for what I'll call the integrated Bitcoin operators. And Bitcoin, to a large extent, can provide for them, you know, a gaming engine. Some of the notable examples of this are uh, Satoshi Dice uses the Bitcoin technology to power pretty much its, you know, the, the ga its own games. Um, another company that I talked to, Bitmillions, uh, also does, you know, relies on what has been described to me as the provably fair technology. Um, Bitcoin really provides the means for almost anyone in you know, open source code to become a gaming operator on a person-to-person on a, uh, -person level. I've also had described to me the, uh, that there's a two-party escrow uh, function that's available, although I'm not, I don't want to address it because I'm a little unclear as to how well that would work. And I don't know if anybody actually uses it now. Now, operators who are in the gaming space also should be considered as potential business-to-business -business clients for using Bitcoin. Um, they face the same costs of cross-border transactions as anyone else. They love to lower their transaction costs, whether it's payments to or from customers, or, or quite honestly, if they're, if they're spread out internationally, 
whether it's, you know, there are suppliers who, who may need to be paid in local currencies, looking at a comparison of the costs of wiring funds versus the costs of, you know, doing a conversion one place and then, you know, and, and basically signing it and doing a conversion, let's say, in euros somewhere else. Um, it's very competitive with what uh, our operators are paying for doing those cross-border transactions. Okay. Basically, one of the uh, issues that I've wanted to address here is the role of lawyers in giving people advice in this area. I went through a couple of articles that counsel Gaming Council, I'm, I'm not going to name, have, have written. And they're, they're, they're pretty much, pretty much you know, well written, but then when they come to their conclusions, they use, if the question is, accepting Bit, should we accept Bitcoin as payment for online gambling services, they run through a rather honest analysis of the law, but then come up with things, well, it's unreliable and unsafe, uh, there's difficulty in hedging Bitcoin exposure, um, there are benefits to the customers, but the conclusions seem to be, that accepting bitcoins for a regulated gaming company is something out of left field and a high risk activity no one should do. I don't think that the lawyers who write articles like that necessarily understand that there are hedging mechanisms available to uh, operators. While what I would call integrated operators like Seals with, Clu uh, sorry, Seals with Clubs and, with, um, and Satoshi Dice that denominate their games in bitcoins need to maintain reserves so they can pay bitcoin balances regardless of currency volatility. Other more traditional gaming companies who accept a bitcoin deposit will, and I, I believe somebody on iPoker was doing this, will immediately credit the account and whatever the, you know, the designated currency is for play, turn around and they do not want to be in the speculative currency business, they do not want to invest in bitcoins, they simply want it as a means to come in, they'll hedge it, and then when the person comes to cash out, if it's an account wagering, they get, you know, they get paid in, in the current, uh, the current uh, value at that time. So the, the, the currency risk can be hedged. Okay. So, so we've got this potential intersection now between online gaming and Bitcoins. Can it yield benefits for people in the Bitcoin industry and for the online gaming industry? I'm going to tell you yes. I think it can if care is taken and operating on both, of the, on both of the systems. Rule number one, if you're riding a train in the United States, don't touch the third rail. You know, subways, you know, it's fatal, don't do it. There's a legal business and business risk in providing payment services to U.S. facing gaming markets. Um, I don't, I don't think that it's worth the risk, to be honest, given the recent enforcement actions that we've seen in Maryland. Um, if it's a regulated U.S. company, that's great. I don't know anybody who's going to accept that now. They're pretty conservative. Um, if you, when I, and I'm sorry, when I said gaming, I was referring to gambling as opposed to social gaming. Social gaming, you know, this is, it's a whole different issue. Um, there's a, the, the risks on, and looking between gaming and gambling Let's say on a, you know, if, you, if you have a scale from you know, like 1 to 15, social games where skill games for prizes, I'd say you know, they're, they're down around 1 or 2. If you're getting into subscription games, whether you know, skill-based or at least treated like that under state law, you're somewhere around a 4. If you're talking about fantasy sports, maybe up to a 6. If you're talking about sports betting, you know, you're off the charts. Don't, don't do it. Um, you want to provide... Bitcoin services to your customers, but let them handle, you know, like transferring or using their coins to go to the gaming sector. If you're in the U.S., you need to get your state licenses if you're going to be an exchange. Um, if you're the rest of the world, you're going to still need to comply with U.S. law if you are dealing with U.S. customers. But the, the basic rule is, you know, like, Maintain <clears throat> your function, but you don't really need to be the payment provider to the gaming companies because your customers have the ability using the existing Bitcoin technology to go ahead and take, take, get the Bitcoin from you and send it off to the gaming company. There's no need for a Bitcoin operator to assume the risk that the company that they're dealing with on the other end of the transaction isn't really doing what they're saying they're doing and maybe they're crossing over some lines and doing something that you don't want to get tagged with as someone supporting an illegal activity in the United States. 
Okay. Now, licensing as a money transmitter, I believe, is really going to be the norm going forward. Um, the good news is, that, as I said before, customers are likely pretty, you know, they're cool with knowing your customer at that level if they want to gamble. Um, in the second tier of transferring the Bitcoins to the gaming service, let the customer handle that. And customers are also cool, it seems, with the gaming operator having personal information so that, you know, they can set up accounts. Now, this sounds like, gee, that's, you know, where did my anonymity go? But the anonymity comes when you, it's, it's because of the payment method that you're using. You know, like, they know who you are, but nobody else is going to know that that Bitcoin really came in to go to XYZ address, or, you know, 16 digits or however many it is. And, a, you know, if care is taken in operating, it, you know, the transactions won't be, you know, reportable back to, I'm not talking about anything illegal, I'm just talking about it won't be reportable back to, you know, your local bank when somebody wants to run a credit report on you, oh my God, this guy is engaged in, you know, online gambling. That shouldn't, that shouldn't really become an issue. Um, I'm not advocating using uh, bitcoins in any way to evade paying taxes should you win. Um, that's always, you know, your responsibility if, you know, if you're the customer. And I don't think that there's a case to be made out that necessarily is like that. There's nothing that prevents someone from engaging in cash transactions in the United States. You just have to, you know, re report them when, when, when it's required and pay your taxes when they're due. Okay. Um, the last topic that I really wanted to get into, though, is the recent activities that we've seen with enforcement apparently in Maryland from the United States District Court in Maryland. Um, I've talked to a number of the folks in the online gaming industry uh, in, in the legal analysis. It is not that difficult. Um, what I'm going to address more is the, the practical aspects. Um, the online gaming industry has been there and done that already. Um, I can tell you that they went through a process where they were, where the online gaming industry was disruptive of the existing market for services. Uh, the public seemed to accept the model. The, uh, you know, gaming chips became, you know, like a trusted currency. They, soon you ended up with regulation in the area. Uh, 2006, a law was passed in the United States. And by the way, this is not just the United States. Um, you know, if, there's a limited amount of time here, but there's similar efforts going on with the uh, Central Bank in Europe, um, with, with the UK. So, you know, it's beyond a little bit of the scope of time that we can talk about it here. And actions were taken basically in enforcement to try to basically put, the, put that industry out of business because it was disrupting the current gaming industry in the United States. Okay. Bitcoins are now at the beginning of that process in the regulatory sense. I think that you will see increased enforcement activity. Um, but what I will tell you is that the industry, the Bitcoin industry will survive this. And when I say Bitcoins, I'm actually talking about virtual currencies. I realize that there are competing forms. But they'll survive this because there is a demand there for it. The, regula the burdens of regulation will not be so great as to kill off demand. And the, the, benefits, the benefits are real. So enforcement's underway if you have to, uh, you know, register and get into know your customer territory, then you have to do that. That this is, you know, this is not, you know, it's not gonna be optional. Um, basically though, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel here and I do see that it's a pretty robust, I spent a lot of time looking at this for gaming folks, this is a pretty robust system and it will, you know, it, it will survive scrutiny and simply has to jump through some unwanted regulated, regulation, regulated hoops. I'll tell you from personal experience, I used to be a gaming operator in an unregulated environment. Regulations are a pain in the ass, but you know, if you want to do business in, in certain jurisdictions, you have to go through them. They, you know, they cost you a lot of money, you have to hire lawyers, you have to hire, you, know, you have to have audit reports done, you have to hire third parties, you're gonna come in on behalf of the regulators to, to, to you know, check your operation, but the Bitcoins in the US, it's a maturing industry, it's gonna happen. Okay, it's one of the, that's pretty much you know, what I want to summarize. I don't know if there are any questions that people might have. If you want to speak to me specifically, you know, I'll take questions afterwards. But other than that, sir.
Yes. Sure. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, the question was, given that Bitcoin doesn't seem to require a central operator to hold funds and the customers can basically can hold their own funds, you know, does that present advantages? Am I stating this fairly? Does that present advantages to the operators and to the players? Okay, and how does that affect the legality? Um, let me first address the enforcement that we've seen in the last week. The enforcement effort, whether it's against gaming or whether it's against bitcoins, comes at the point where there's a transaction that would go from the fiat currency into the, uh, into the, into the bitcoins. That makes you a money transmitter. Um, a number of the gaming prosecutions were also done. Oh my God, you're, you know, the, provi the payment providers were basically tagged for being an unlicensed money transmitter. So that, that same, at the initial deposit transaction, or the initial purchase of Bitcoins, there, you know, there's, still, there's still the same vulnerability to you know, like, uh, enforcement scrutiny. Now, oh yeah, yeah, but you have to get, unless you're a miner, which has its own, raises its own issues under FinCEN, you, know, you have to get the Bitcoins from somewhere. Once, once the Bitcoins are, are bought, then you know, again, none of this affects the, the legality of the underlying activity, whether you're buying a pizza online or whether or not you're gambling online. You know, if it's legal, it's legal. If, it was, if the activity is illegal, then it's illegal. So, it does, you know, so I think it's a quick answer is no, it doesn't affect the legality because what you, you, the player, or you, the operator, are still going to be doing whatever it is you're doing, and that, that's legal or not. Yes. Hey, um, I had a question about the know your customer um, aspect that you talked about. So say you're doing something that is very clearly uh, legitimate, you know, way on the scale of skill game or whatever, and it's very clearly legal. Um, how do you, what kind of information do you need to establish that know that customer because a Bitcoin transaction is just anonymous address to anonymous address? Like, do you have to also get their email or their name? Like, what, what kind of info do you need to get? Okay. I can't give you a, a legal opinion on this, but I'll tell no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, because you're probably governed by some state law that, you know, it's applicable. One of, you know, if you're in the U.S., in what, what other, whatever states you're operating in, it's probably going to tell you what you need to do for Know Your Customer. The second thing to remember, though, is that the second address isn't really anonymous. The second address is going to be furnished by you to the customer to send the money to. So, that, you know, so you know who you are, so that, you know, you're covered there. Um, what sort of requirements you'd have to fulfill, I, I just can't address, because that, that'll be determined by whatever states you operate in, if you're talking about skill gaming, for example. Okay, is it primarily state, or is it state and federal? The, 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 it, it's state, you know, if, if you're talking about state, you know, about skill games, you're talking about state law. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can you give an example of the most severe uh, thing you need to know versus the most loose? Like, is it ever social security numbers? Or is it ever well, uh, well, let me put this way. I just, I just signed up for... Uh, legal online poker in, in Nevada, and yeah, they want my social security number, which was then turned over to someone who had a bad record of treating customers, but that, that's, that's a different issue. But yeah, yeah, the most severe one I think is probably Nevada regulations for online gaming. Yes, social security number, they ping your telephone to make sure you're in the state when you're playing. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty onerous. I'm, I'm actually gonna do comments for the Nevada Gaming Commission saying, look, you know, the regulations say reasonable, I think some of this stuff is, you know, goes a little beyond that. Yeah. I uh, apologize if you addressed this. I came in a little bit late. But uh, what are your opinions on the legality, either at the federal or the state levels, of these sites that are operating, you know, essentially in a Bitcoin, Bitcoin only fashion? They're accepting Bitcoin. You can only receive payout in Bitcoin, never touching the banking system. Like, what are, what's the legal status of, of these, these sites? Today? Well, what I can tell you is that uh, Satoshi Dice has uh, withdrawn from the U.S. market. Um, beyond that, um, no, I'm not going to really, I, I, I don't know who else is out there. The folks that I talk to seem to be in that business. I've never talked to Seal with, Seals with Clubs, so I have no idea what they're doing. I talked to another company that pretty much seems, you know, I couldn't tell from talking whether, are you in Panama, are you in Costa Rica, are you in Malta, you know, it was a little difficult to tell. but. Um, addressing just the legality overall is that it's going to be legal or illegal probably it's okay 
you will probably be violated, if you're in gambling as opposed to gaming, you're probably violating laws in, whatever, in almost any state that you're going to be operating in. Now that could trigger, that could trigger a federal uh, violation under the uh, Illegal Gaming Business Act. Um, I have a difference of opinion with some councils whether or not that triggers a violation under the uh, UIGEA from 2006. You know, that, 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 to me, that's an open issue. Um, some folks say, yes, it does because it violates state law. I'm saying, no, it doesn't necessarily. Don't quote me on this one because I'm not giving legal advice. I, I'm saying I think there's a co this question of coverage because the entire UIGEA is tied to the U.S. banking system, and if you're never involved in the U.S. banking system, right. you escape that. But, but the penalties otherwise for all the other things that, you, that an illegal operation would be doing are still severe. You know, it's not like... You know, it's not it's going to significantly affect your risk profile. Thanks. Um, casinos now are also regulated by FinCEN, and I understand they have requirements to file suspicious activity reports. Yes. Now, since FinCEN has issued guidance uh, treating Bitcoin as currency, you expect that SARS, SARCs will have to be filed on pure Bitcoin transactions? Uh, good question. I think probably yes. Um, I took a look at the uh, FinCENs for brick and mortars, and... They'll, they'll, get, they'll, get, they'll get around, you know, they'll get around to it at some point. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, on, on the brick and mortar side, um, if somebody's sitting at the table and they're betting $500, you know, and they're, they're buying for $500, then they're buying for $500, buying for $500. I don't know if in practice they file the SARS until the guy is going to cash out. Or, you know, I mean, in theory they're supposed to, but, you know, I, I can't tell you, I, I, don't, I don't play, I don't gamble, and I, I, can't, you know, I can't tell you from observing whether they do it or not. But, yeah, your, your point's a very good one. I think they will. Okay. Um, if the, 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 the more interesting question is, will the online, would online gaming, who would have to file SARS reports, even be allowed to take Bitcoins? That's going to come up in regulation. Right, that, that, that I don't know the answer to. How would you define a suspicious Bitcoin transaction? Pardon? How would you define a suspicious Bitcoin transaction? I'm not a regulator. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think any of them are suspicious. <laughs> some people think the opposite yeah. of all of them are. Pardon? Some, some people think that all of them are. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, and and to, be, to be honest, uh, the question is, what does this enforcement activity in Maryland really represent? Because there is another, you know, there, there's another angle to it. I've had experience. I've dealt with the U.S. Attorney's Office before on uh, I actually acquired some seized property that they had from them directly. Um, they've had a history of going after gaming. Um, they, pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There was a seizure of uh, funds from Dwala that belonged to uh, Mount Gox, initiated by the federal district court and by the federal uh, prosecutor in Maryland, uh, Department of Homeland Security. Um, this was last week. We haven't seen the underlying case that this is related to, other than, you know, whether or not it goes beyond, whether it's an, really an assault on Bitcoin as such, or it simply was, oh, Jesus is unlicensed, you know, this is an unlicensed uh, gaming case. The, the warrant was for an 18 U.S. Code 1960 violation. Yeah, 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 I saw the warrant, but th th that, that's the warrant, but was that, f what I don't know the answer to, quite frankly, is, is, that part of a lar is that part of a larger effort to go after Bitcoin? I've got some suspicions in that regard, and what I will tell you is that the U.S. Attorney Office, the, the fellows handling this matter, most likely, um, actually is a pretty straight shooter. He's doing his job, and other than that, you know, they're 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 not, they're not you know they're not unreasonable. This is this is what they're you know it may be that his job is simply this guy didn't file a required report, but the question is why you know why are they going after him? And I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty soon, but if you get quickly. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a newbie question, but uh, I was wondering what the, the legal status is for facilitating simply the ability for one person to gamble with another, but like, for instance, just giving them the tools to do it, but in not, way, not in any way holding the money or, uh, you know, logging the transactions or whatever. Okay, uh, good, good question. I'll have an answer. It's, if you think locally, it's like if you had a bar and you had a table which happened to have some dice on it, you know, and you know, whatever happens is whatever happens, you just don't look at it. No, um, probably, probably a super newbie question. <laughs> no, 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 actually it's, good, it's a good question. Uh, 18 U.S.C. section 1960 says that if you are, a, even if you're a licensed money transmitter, that if you are 
uh, otherwise involve, if transactions otherwise involve the transportation or transmission of funds that are known to the defendant, meaning your hypothetical guy, to, uh, uh, that they are intended to be used to promote or support unlawful activity, uh, you got a federal felony. Right. So, yeah. So, okay. so if, if you know that it's for gambling, no bar. even if you're licensed, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. Cool. All right, thanks. Well, not, actually, a bar is probably all cash anyway, unless you, you know, it's, uh, you know, the cafe, some cafe and that happens to take bitcoins. And then gambles with bitcoins at the table, unlikely. I'm sorry, I got time for one more. Um, I'm from Costa Rica, which is a heavy one from. For La Pura Vida. <laughs> La Pura Vida, sure. Um, I mean, tons of common uh, 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 operators there. Um, I just want to be sure I understand how uh, to keep my high sales. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble. Here. Sure. I just want to be sure that I understand uh, how I can keep myself safe in case I decide to open a online gambling site. Well, um, well, you're here. That's not a good idea. Correct. <laughs> no, so, so um, that the first, the first thing is, uh, I mean, and I think in just totally oriented Bitcoin gambling side. Okay. Uh, oh. the, 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 the main question. Hey, is where do I have to host my application? I mean, my server. When do I have to have my server? I mean, should it be a good idea just to keep it there in Costa Rica, which is unregulated at this time? Or uh, well, I'll, t I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you after this presentation. Okay, good. Yeah, okay, no problem. Okay. Thank you very much. No more questions.